Let's uh, get started. Welcome everyone to uh, this CIW seminar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians uh, on whose land we meet today, uh, and we pay our respect to their elders uh, past and present. Uh, my name is Ben Hillman. I'm the director of the Australian Centre on China and the World here at ANU, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, our speaker tonight, Joseph Terigian, who is a visiting fellow uh, at the Australian Centre on China and the World. And tonight uh, he's uh, going to be uh, presenting a much awaited seminar on Xi Jinping, what's new and what's old uh, in Xi Jinping as a Chinese leader. We have an hour and a half allocated uh, for this seminar. Joseph will speak for about uh, 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, and we have a good amount of time uh, for Q&A afterwards. Uh, there's a, there are a large number of people uh, joining us online. Welcome uh, from uh, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, if you have questions uh, uh, in the online community, can I uh, encourage you please to send those questions through the chat function uh, on Zoom, and we will collect those questions and uh, put them to Joseph. For the benefit also of our uh, online audience, uh, please keep your uh, questions uh, brief uh, afterwards and we'll ask Joseph to also quickly uh, summarize those questions coming from the audience attending in person here uh, so that the microphone can pick that up and convey that to our online audience. So very big welcome Joseph and over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you to Ben and Sharon and Nancy for uh, setting this up. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I know this is uh, talk four, so thanks for uh, your continued uh, interest in these conversations. Uh, today, uh, I'll be talking about what's new and old uh, with Xi Jinping. And we have commonly seen claims that he represents something fundamentally different from the past, or at least something very different from what China has seen since 1976. Uh, but at the same time, Xi Jinping remains a somewhat mysterious figure. Stephen Lee Myers, journalist for the New York Times wrote about him that what is striking is how little is known about Mr. Xi's biography as leader. The Wall Street Journal a few years later wrote an article called uh, How the US Misread China's Xi, uh, hoping for a globalist, it got an autocrat. Uh, one of those people who misread uh, Xi Jinping was Nicholas Kristof, who had spent years and years and years uh, in the PRC, who wrote in 2012, the new paramount leader Xi Jinping will spearhead a resurgence of economic reform and probably some political easing as well. Mao's body will be hauled out of Tiananmen Square on his watch. And Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winning writer, will be released from prison. But this wasn't a case of Westerners being dumb and not understanding China, we can now see in the Li Ray archives uh, at Stanford University, as well as on um, transcripts we have of Yen Huang Tuanxiao, a very famous pro-reform journal in Beijing, that in 2012, many of these elders who hoped for uh, more constitutionalism and reform also had hoped that Xi Jinping would have been different. And we can see in sort of real time this increasing disillusionment uh, with Xi Jinping as they understood uh, what kind of uh, a leader he was going to be. And in fact, Li Rei uh, on his deathbed uh, told his daughter as well as one of the sons of Hu Yaobang, the great uh, uh, liberal reformer of the 1980s general secretary, that I don't understand how he became this kind of person. I just don't get it. I bequeath to you a mission of figuring out what went wrong and why he is the kind of person uh, that he is. Uh, but in fact, uh, Xi Jinping, even in a system where it's hard to get a good read on people, was always an exceptionally difficult target. Li Rei in 2002, uh, when he met Xi Jinping after a big uh, promotion, said to Xi Jinping, you know, your position is different now. You should speak up more. And Xi Jinping said, no, I'm not like you. I don't know how to play ping pong with the ball just hitting the edge without going over, meaning I don't know where the line is and I'm not going to push it. Uh, Gao Wenxian, a very famous party historian who wrote an important biography of Zhou Enlai, theorized that some of this had to do with Xi Jinping's background. So Xi Jinping's father was purged much earlier than most of the other leaders at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Xi Zhongxun, 
uh, was kicked out of leadership in 1962, which led Gao Wenxian to conclude that because Xi Jinping was only nine years old when his father fell, the tough environment directly influenced his personality. He is therefore good at forbearance and concealing his intentions. In fact, Xi Jinping himself has talked about the importance of sometimes concealing his intentions. Uh, he once said that my father bequeathed me with two legacies. The first was not to persecute people. The second was not to lie. The first is possible, that's what he said, but the second is not, revealing this very utilitarian approach to political language. Uh, and as I talked about uh, two weeks ago, it's really, always been hard for Chinese, for people watching Chinese politics to get things right. Uh, and it's gotten harder under Xi Jinping. Uh, and I certainly don't have any um, personal contacts in Zhongnan High. Uh, but what I'm hoping tonight to do is to draw upon history to provide context and talk about how Leninist parties generally work and how Xi Jinping uh, fits. And I'll focus specifically on two issues. The first is elite po politics and the nature of power. Uh, and the second is ideology, and I'll, I'll foreshadow my two main points now. Uh, with regards to elite politics, even though Xi Jinping has very clearly arrogated a lot of power to himself, uh, the CCP has always been an extremely leader-friendly system. And second, with regards to ideology, uh, the way that Xi Jinping has always uh, talked about his own views on this topic, uh, as well as his own experiences, suggests that he is very obviously obsessed with the importance of devotion and conviction and seeing these as really keys to regime survival. Uh, he's repeatedly signaled that China will not go back to the radical Mao era uh, and has proven that in terms of policy, he has some capacity uh, for flexibility uh, and course correction. But let me begin with elite politics. And uh, you'll have to indulge me with uh, my first anecdote, which is about the 7,000 uh, Ketter Conference of 1962. And the only reason I'm letting myself talk about this is because if you've been following China recently, it's something that has come up. Uh, and there has been a claim that this meeting that Premier Li Keqiang had with many, 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 many uh, regional party leaders uh, was in essence similar to this 1962 conference in that they were both cases of the deputy to the top leader challenging or counterbalancing the top leader because the top leader screwed up uh, and things were going in the wrong direction. Uh, and this speaks to this broader understanding that's still very common of Chinese politics at the time, which was that Liu Shaoqi was the pragmat pragmatic bureaucrat with Mao Zedong as this revolutionary modernizer. But we now know uh, with the evidence uh, that has since come to light that this was a misunderstanding of the nature of this conference and that in fact, uh, Liu Shaoqi would never dream of directly challenging the top leader. This isn't just simply how these types of systems work. And that his understanding was that Mao himself had already gotten on board with rectification, uh, saw the problems, tried to address them, but this was not seen um, by anyone really as an incipient challenge to Mao. Although Mao himself, looking at the language that Liu Shaoqi had used, concluded that he still wasn't quite pro-Mao enough. Uh, but... Um, I also mentioned uh, two weeks ago this case of Peng Zhen, who had made these comments rather critical of Mao, and had always been interpreted as meaning that Mao was under threat. Uh, but we now know that actually the language that Peng Zhen was using was coming from exactly what he thought Mao wanted him to say, uh, which again suggests the sprawl of how much you know we. Uh, it's hard for outsiders um, to appreciate in terms of what is actually going on uh, under the water. So even at this moment when Mao was allegedly under um, most challenge, he was still firmly in control. And sure enough, by the end of that year in 1962, he had returned to a primary focus on class struggle. And as soon as he made that decision, nobody had anything else to say about it. But more commonly, uh, Xi Jinping is said to reject the model of Deng Xiaoping. So people have heard that Deng Xiaoping was this institutionalizer, someone who cared about creating guardrails to prevent a new Mao, someone who cared about collective leadership, someone who was checked by these other oligarchs who had a revolutionary prestige that made it hard for Deng to simply override them. Uh, and we've seen this, uh, this view most recently in an article in The Atlantic that came out, I think, just a few days ago that said that China is rejecting this earlier model of pragmatism in which the top leader was constrained. Uh, and now Xi Jinping is a danger because he can do uh, whatever he wants. Uh, and if you came to my book talk, you'll see that I have a very different view of Deng Xiaoping, that in fact, even during the 1980s, the supposed uh, golden era, uh, Deng was the core. 
and Dung was able to make up his mind whenever he wanted to. I'll give you some anecdotes about this, beginning with Chen Yun. Now, um, I assume that a lot of the people here have a pretty deep knowledge of Chinese politics, otherwise they wouldn't spend their Thursday night talking about this with me. Uh, so you, you've probably heard that Chen Yun was this very senior revolutionary, uh, that he had a lot of power, that he could check Dong and often did, but what the evidence now suggests was that Chun always put Deng's authority in the number one priority. Uh, so for one example, Chun Yun once went to Zhao Ziyang, the general secretary, and said, why don't we have any meetings? Why don't we have any Politburo Standing Committee meetings? And Zhao Ziyang said, well, you need to go talk to Deng Xiaoping about that. Uh, I'm just a secretary. And then Chun Yun walked off sort of muttering, just a secretary, just a secretary. Uh, Deng Xiaoping told uh, Bo Yibo, the father of Bo Xilai, who I think probably a lot of people have heard of, um, to tell people like Chun Yun and Li Xianyan that the party can only have one mother-in-law. Uh, we know that Deng Xiaoping saw this core status for the leader as an inherent strength of the Chinese system. One example he gave actually was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. He said all they had to do is have a meeting and they could invade. Now this, you know, for people who knew, who now know how that war went, might be able to see this as kind of a curious, but maybe a revealing anecdote that Dung would talk about. Uh, but Dung also said, you know, we're better than the United States. Uh, we're more decisive than them precisely because they have three governments, but we just have one person who can essentially say uh, what goes. Uh, Chun Yun, in fact, used a very curious term once to refer to Deng. This was in May of 1989, shortly before the June 4 crackdown, in which he declared Deng as the Kouzi, which is sort of like a triad mafia type term, which I guess is roughly translated, people can correct me, as, as Capo, sort of the godfather. But when his official remarks were published, that was changed to core. I'm not saying that CCP is a mafia organization, but it shows the extent to which even Chun Yun would use this kind of language to refer uh, to Deng Xiaoping. And if you want to talk about Deng being constrained, well, in 1978, this was before he was the top leader, and his bailiwick uh, included the PLA, he was able to engineer a war on Vietnam, even though almost the entire leadership, including Hua Guofeng, who was the official top leader, thought that the war was a bad idea. In 1988, Deng pushed through price reform, which was a huge disaster and almost sank reform and opening. He did this without the permission or approval or deliberation with any, with uh, most of the other key figures in the leadership. 1989, which surprisingly we're coming to realize just how few people within the top leadership actually wanted a violent crackdown, but Deng was still able to engineer it. And then 1992, the Southern Tour, when Deng Xiaoping was no longer even head of the Central Military Commission, he could reverse the change in the center's policies, uh, once again, towards uh, focusing on reform and opening, and almost might have, once again, removed another named successor, this time in the individual of Jiang Zemin. So this is not really a case of an institutionalizer, right? So the idea that uh, Xi Jinping is rejecting this model, I think needs to be revised in this sort of understanding of how these systems work, but which begs the question of why Deng was so powerful. I think it was several things. The first was that there was a real taboo against factions. In some occasions, people surrounding Chun Yun would talk about maybe we need to be more um, explicit about our concerns about where reform is going, and Chun Yun would say, we can't act in concert this way, that's too dangerous. So even sort of the head of that group, which I think was much less than a faction, uh, he, would, he would still try to rein them in. Uh, there was a sense that these parties only work with the core, that they only really work when one person can make final decisions. Deng Xiaoping had enormous revolutionary prestige, and if you've come to my earlier talks, you've heard me talk about how the political culture of these types of systems is Lun Zipai Bei, right? Like what you put into the revolution, displaying your commitment to the revolution, demonstrating your ability to see farther and do better is something that really goes a long way in terms of whether or not people respect you and whether or not your authority within the party um, is reflected in that particular way. And of, of course, he was seen as a military leader, someone who wa wasn't just a commissar of a field army, but was in charge of the, of the joint um, office that commanded the Huaihai campaign, one of the key decisive victories in the, in the defeat um, of the KMT and the victory of the Chinese Communist Party. But what's interesting about Deng Xiaoping is that he ruled from behind the curtain, right? So he wasn't making a lot of day-to-day -day decision making, and he liked to create the impression that there was a lot more inter-party democracy uh, than there really was. Uh, this created a lot of pathologies, um, which for reasons we can talk about 
Uh, I think Xi Jinping is actually reacting to by in some ways being even more institutionalized than Deng Xiaoping. But I want to say that Xi Jinping shares many of the strengths that Deng had, but in some key ways, um, very different. The first is that he doesn't have the revolutionary prestige that Deng did. But I think that you can see in the way that the propaganda apparatus is working, that the way that there are these discussions of the defeat of COVID, um, the defeat of other challenges is sort of used as a, as a narrative to make, to sort of mimic or parallel that earlier tradition within the party of, of you know, being the person who saw better and understood more deeply. But even more crucially, I think, is that Xi Jinping is both the core, but he's also the one making decisions, right? There isn't, there aren't two lines like there were um, during uh, much of the Mao and, and Deng era. And I also want to say that I think Xi Jinping is extremely powerful, very powerful, and then a move against him is very, very, very unlikely. But compared to Deng, it's at least conceivable, as opposed to, to Deng's power, which for the reasons I just suggested to you, went through incredible stress tests and was still able to come out on top. We have not seen Xi Jinping go through stress, stress tests like the ones that Deng Xiaoping went through. So let's elite politics, and I'll talk a little bit about ideology. So uh, I believe Fred Tevis is, is sitting in, and a lot of his career was to show that previous understandings of Chinese Communist Party history as a continuous struggle of two lines really overstated the significance of alleged cohesive competing policy-oriented factions within the CCP elite. Uh, so for example, as I mentioned before, Liu Shaoqi was often seen as sort of the more pragmatic individual who was able to uh, resist Mao in certain ways. But Liu Shaoqi was an interesting figure in ways that we're only slowly coming to understand. Um, the first is that when it came to persecuting people, you know, a leftist thing, Liu Shaoqi was Zheng Ren, the Iba Hao Shou, right? He could really go after people. So if you look at um, the socialist education campaign, in some ways, Liu Shaoqi was even more leftist than Mao Zedong, right? This was someone who could be very aggressive against members of the party that he thought um, were problematic. But he could swing like sort of left and right in ways that weren't really cohesive. So early in the early years of the PRC, he certainly made comments especially a very famous speech he made in Tianjin that was seen by Mao as not sufficiently radical. But to say that Liu Shaoqi was consistently one way or the other, I think is a misunderstanding of Liu, but also the idea that he resisted Mao or saw or conceived himself as a counterbalance, uh, I think is an overstatement. But I wanna talk a little bit about why Xi Jinping's father also reveals just how easy it is for outsiders to get ideology right and how difficult it is to say that there are these cohesive, meaningful ideological differences within the party. Why do I think Xi Jinping's father is such a good example? Well, uh, if you've heard of Xi Jinping, you know that he has this reputation as like the inveterate reformer, like the true liberal, like the a representation of the, of the humane wing of the party, someone who really thought about things in a way that were very different from the people who like to persecute or were very dogmatic or pursued policies that were more ambitious than actually could be achieved. And I think there's some, there's some truth there, right? So uh, Xi Jinping in his later years would tell people that, you know, in my career, I take pride in two things. I never persecuted anyone and I never made any leftist mistakes. Uh, but uh, he also played a big role in the creation of the special economic zones, something that really can't be denied. But like most things in Chinese politics, we, we need context for this, right? Uh, why do I say that? Well, the first is that people don't really rally coalitions to pursue policy agendas in this type of system. Really what the game is, is you understand what the top leader wants, something that Roderick McFarquhar called intuiting, uh, working towards the chairman. Uh, and you either try to persuade the top leader or you use what the top leader said to compete with other people. But once the top leader makes up their mind, you don't have the right to resist that, right? And in fact, what's so interesting about Xi Jinping is that when Mao Zedong in the Yan'an era, as a gift, uh, wrote these um, T5s, expressions for a younger generation that he thought very pithily characterized their essential characteristics, for Xi Jinping, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what it was, but it was the party's interests come first. So even in a system where the party's interests come first, Mao Zedong said Xi Jinping, you take the party's interests first. This is the kind of individual that Xi Jinping was, right? So um, uh, in terms of uh, Xi Jinping, also I want to mention that this was somebody who almost took pride in his ability to 
follow the party line and remain faithful in the party, even during the worst possible moments, right? So in the 1990s, he once bragged to a, a foreign scholar, Deng Xiaoping was persecuted by his own party three times, but I was persecuted by my own party five times. And for ways that's sometimes hard for outsiders to understand was he was actually bragging. Now, why would that be bragging? Well, it's showing that this was a forging experience for him and that he was still loyal to the party, even though he went through all of this kind of thing, right? So um, I also want to mention that uh, when it comes to Xi Jinping, his views didn't really consistently fit on a sort of left-right spectrum. So I can give you some examples. He very strongly supported the special economic zones in Guangdong, but he opposed the household, uh, household responsibility system. Now, you want to think about one of the key triumphs and insights and innovative new policies that made reform and opening possible. It was the household responsibility system. But Xi Jinping saw this from a rather conservative um, position, right? And I interviewed someone uh, who was sort of Xi Jinping's minder when he visited the United States. And they went to a place called the Amana Colonies. Has anybody heard of this place? Well, it was basically um, uh, a religious communal um, uh, system that ultimately decided to disband and go their own way and have their own farms. And Xi Jinping, when he was listening to this American tour guide tell this story, as it was related to me, he was getting increasingly agitated and like sort of stood up and was like asking all these questions and became very animated, um, which shows that even somebody who was sort of the quintessential reformer on certain issues could actually be uh, quite conservative. Uh, he definitely, compared to many others in the elites, did believe that when it came to ethnic issues like Tibet and Xinjiang, that co-optation very often was a more useful uh, tool than tightening the screws. And we have um, a document that shows that when there was uh, an incident in the early 1980s in Kashgar, that Xi Jinping, who was in charge of religious, religious affairs for the secretariat at the time, called uh, the local uh, uh, regional leader of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region and said, don't rush in with guns, don't shoot people, find local prominent personages who have respect in the Uyghur community and have them talk people down. Otherwise, if there's a crackdown, it'll just make everything worse and people will be more upset. So he saw this as a possibility um, and other people you know, didn't see it that way. But at the same time, he was very hard line on Catholics, right? So even on certain like specific religious organizations, he could be, he could sort of shift. Uh, and also despite this view in, uh, in Tiananmen Square, uh, we know that he was uh, deeply agitated. He didn't want things to go in the direction that they did. But once the top party leadership coalesced uh, in support of martial law, he again towed the line and came out uh, in support of it, right? Also, he was in a, like, sometimes as people who aren't part of the system, it's hard to guess how certain emotional things will correlate in ways that might be surprising to us, right? So Xi Jinping's, one of Xi Jinping's daughters was, was persecuted to death during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Xi Jinping spent 16 years in the political wilderness. That's much longer than most other people uh, within the elite. Uh, and he said uh, after the Cultural Revolution on several different occasions that we need to find some kind of new system that will prevent a new strongman leader like Mao from coming forward. Uh, we need to have uh, a new law to protect different opinions within the party. Um, but at the same time, whenever people would cr would criticize Mao in his presence, he would lose his temper and stand up and yell at them, right? So he could have these two different, maybe for us, almost incompatible views at the same time. Uh, and I think part of it was maybe a utilitarian thing, this idea that if you criticize Mao, uh, that damages the party. And this was someone, as I said before, someone who puts the party's interests first. But sometimes these things correlate in ways that are a little bit surprising that don't fit clear ideological uh, left-right uh, spectrums. So just as the idea that Xi Jinping was the pure reformer is problematic, I want to suggest certain ways, although not always, that saying Xi Jinping is a radical Maoist uh, can obscure more than it illuminates. And before I do that, I want to preface a little bit by saying that Xi Jinping is really a textbook Leninist. So I don't know if people here have read um, Selznick's 1952 treatment on like the inherent characteristics of Leninism, and you read this uh, 70 years later, and you're like, wow, this really still nails exactly how the CCP works uh, in terms of the idea that you have a theory that everybody uh, unites behind, a useful unifying force, that it only works with a core, somebody who at the very top makes decisions that creates, that makes the party work as an organizational weapon. Uh, this idea of forging, right, that when you go through difficult experiences, it actually rededicates people to the cause. Um, this taboo uh, against factions, this idea that this is not 
an organization in the sense of uh, uh, it being where people with like-minded ideas come together and work together, but that it's like a guild, right? Where you have a mobilization of your entire personality and that you sacrifice yourself. You're not pursuing your own interests. You're subsuming them to a larger organization. That's all stuff that very clearly are things that Xi Jinping believes about this party and are all very classical Leninist. Um, but is she a Maoist? Well, let me first also preface that by saying there were lots of different Maos, right? So if you read work by Fred Tevis, Timothy Cheek, the Mao of the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s are very different from the Mao of 1966 to 1967, right? So Xi Jinping, I think, can claim uh, a, a legacy inherited from Mao that he can say is Maoist while not focusing on, on the bad parts, right? But um, in terms of you know, what Xi Jinping actually experienced during the Mao era, it was rough. It was rough, right? So he saw his mother subjected to struggle sessions. His mother watched Xi Jinping during struggle sessions and he participated in the, in the yelling against him. On one occasion, Xi Jinping, who was in his early teens, went home after even though he was incarcerated and his mother wouldn't let him into the house precisely because she and the rest of the family could have gotten in trouble and he had other siblings that the mother needed to work about uh worry about uh in 1969 he was essentially exiled to the countryside and he described how when he was at the train station everybody else was crying but he was smiling and people were saying why are you smiling he's like well if i stay here there, there, there's nothing for me to do, you know, I'll be persecuted, I, I will be detained. In fact, he had been detained and he said in the 80s that it was so bad he thought that he might die. Uh, he spent seven years as a Santan youth in, in Shanxi in a particularly um, poor uh, region. As I said, his half-sister uh, was persecuted to death. When he saw his father for the first time in many years, his father couldn't distinguish between him and his brother because it had been so long. Uh, so it was rough, right? And he has talked about the experience as uh, a positive one in the sense that it led him to be forged and it dedicated himself to the cause. But he also said, uh, when the ideals of the Cultural Revolution could not be realized, it proved an illusion. He said it was dogmatic. It was a result of not having seen the real world. But what's interesting is he also said that it really made him question his belief in communism, but precisely because this experience taught him to think for himself and be critical, and then he did still decide that communism was the right path for China, that this therefore is something that could never be shaken in him. And this also gets back to this idea of forging, right? That, that being challenged ultimately actually leads you to more dedication to the cause. Uh, his first job at the grassroots was in Hebei province in the early 1980s. Uh, so Hebei actually was sending more petitioners to Beijing complaining about um, leftism, factionalism, conservatism, more than any other province. Uh, and before starting in Zhengdang, Xi Jinping said that he was willing to work in another county called Pingshan, but he was warned not to go there because factions uh, were throwing explosives, literally explosives at each other, right? And so after he arrived there, Xi Jinping said uh, that the Cultural Revolution should be blamed for party member conduct. And he mocked old dogmatists who were dazzled and felt dizzy uh, when they saw, when they heard music, they did not understand, uh, and peasants wearing blue jeans. So in other words, he was saying just how bad the Cultural Revolution had left China, right? Um, what's interesting, too, is that during the reform and opening, he displayed sort of a practical um, sentimentality towards it. So there was an article in China Youth in 1985 about Xi Jinping in Hebei, and the article quoted a famous novelist people have probably heard of, Jia Dashan, and Jia says, here you don't hear everyone shouting reform, but reform is everywhere. Xi Jinping is a reformer who does not wear Western style clothes, and he forges ahead without acting aggressively. While persuading people to accept the historical necessity of reform, he can still leisurely have a drink of alcohol. This is a reformer who makes progress with a smile on his face. And Xi Jinping himself said in this article that reform was the wish of the Chinese people, but blind reform is just a romantic lyrical poem, right? So he's condemning the Cultural Revolution. He's praising reform and opening, but, but still saying that we shouldn't just reform and opening for the sake of reform and opening. We need to be practical about it. But he was also still also displaying a very clear worry about ideals and conviction. And we know in the 1980s that lots of people who had experienced the Cultural Revolution, especially his generation, had this mindset of they wanted to make up for lost time or they were seeing a Chinese culture become more materialistic. There was uh, a loss of idealism. There was this idea that after Maoism was no longer seen as a legitimate um, pursuit that, you know, what are we supposed to believe in? Uh, 
And there was an article that was published, I believe in uh, Youth Daily that sort of um, conceptualized this saying, I don't know what to live anymore. It was sort of this, you know, I don't have any more energy, kind of very like a Tang Ping sort of like approach again in the 1980s. And so there was an article that was published in Hebei Youth that Xi Jinping said explicitly that he saw as a reaction to this trend in society. And Xi Jinping um, in this article portrayed him as someone quote, forged and rededicated to the people by the cultural revolution as opposed to other people who decided they wanted to have fun and make up for lost time. Xi Jinping said that only if people like him devoted their lives to the party's mission and not personal interests could another cultural revolution be avoided, explicitly saying that this is one of the reasons I have chosen this life. So Xi Jinping in the 1980s saying, I am not having a different kind of life of going overseas and having fun because I don't want another cultural revolution to happen. Very interesting thing that is maybe surprising given our understand him, understanding of him. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, Xi Jinping uh, repeatedly addressed these ongoing discussions about the nature of socialism. And he presented really a sort of studiously neutral position during the debates. So he was always looking for a sort of middle path perspective. So he was very clearly deeply supportive of reform and opening, but he worried about how the market um, conflicted with selfless sacrifice and how the pursuit of uh, profits could be destabilizing. So unhealthy expansion of capital sort of in the, in the 1990s already. Um, but he criticized people who dogmatically asked whether certain policies were inherently socialist or not, uh, while still emphasizing that marketization created real practical problems, but saying that they should be approached without an ideological perspective. Uh, and he continued to condemn the Cultural Revolution. So in 2000, he said, the gratefulness of the masses shames us. If not for the Cultural Revolution, the issue of the Fujo boat people would have been resolved much earlier. We, members of the CCP, absolutely must not owe the masses a debt. So I wanna finish up with one last issue, which is whether Xi Jinping has explicitly introduced a new agenda that rejects reform and opening and returns to a Maoist path, which is something that we've seen, I think um, pretty commonly uh, in, um, in the media and Twitter recently. Uh, but saying whether or not Xi Jinping himself has signaled a change deliberately elides another question, which is whether or not he really is actually returning to a Maoist era. Uh, and I want, I want to um, briefly address that by saying when I talked to Taylor Frable about whether or not military doctrine has changed under Xi Jinping, Taylor Frable says, no, they have a new military doctrine and it's named after Xi Jinping, but it's not actually all that different. Xi Jinping just needed his own military doctrine. If you talk to Courtney Fong about China's behavior in the UN, she says, well, actually, we see a lot of continuity from before Xi Jinping. Um, if you talk to Andrew Chubb, uh, who works on South China Sea, he says, well, actually, um, China's ambitions in the South China Sea predate Xi Jinping. Um, and what's interesting is Hu Jintao, we know during his era, actually said that we need to learn from Cuba and North Korea in terms of ideology, which isn't something we tend to associate with Hu Jintao. Uh, in an article at the end of the Hu Jintao era um, that sort of had like a big picture approach, Roderick McFarquhar was quoted in it where he said, I believe a lot of intellectuals thought that Hu Jintao would be presiding over a much more liberal atmosphere or intellectual life. But in fact, most people will tell you there has been a retreat from what there was under Jiang Zemin. So let's set aside this question of how different policies really are between Xi Jinping and his predecessors, because I think we could talk about each one sort of separately. But I also want to say that periodization about whether or not Xi Jinping represents a new era is inherently political, inherently political, right? I don't know if people in this room have heard the name Zhu Jiamu. So Zhu Jiamu is interesting for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that his father was a man named Zhu Li Zhi. And Zhu Li Zhi was the guy who led the purge in 1935 that Xi Jinping believed almost led to him being buried alive, right? Zhu Jiamu was the person who Apparently, it was the first individual who came up with the idea that neither of the two 30 years could be rejected. What does that mean? Well, it means the 30 years before the Cultural Revolution cannot be rejected, and the 30 years since reform and opening has started cannot be rejected earlier uh, either, something that Xi Jinping has described to. But what's interesting is, at a princeling conversation of people who are more pro-reform, one of them was saying, he seems to be talking to people like Zhu Jiamu, why isn't he talking to the children of Hu like Bang and people like that, right? Which is an interesting sort of as a side note that he's listening to the son of the person who did this to his father and who also happened to be the secretary to Chun Yun. And Xi Jinping and Chun Yun did not get along either. Um, Xi Jinping had some rather choice comments about Chun Yun that we can talk about in the Q&A. But anyways, back to Zhu Jiamu. Uh, Zhu Jiamu wrote an article in 2009. Zhu Jiamu wrote an article in 2009 and he said, a new era began in 2002. 
Why? Because Hu Jintao decided we needed to have a scientific approach, scientific development, right? And said that we can't only worry about economic development, we need to worry about the quality of economic development. And he said, this is a new era that's different from the 19, from the, excuse me, the 1992 era, right? This is in 2009. Then last year, Zhu Jiamu wrote a new article and he said, I changed my mind. Actually, the new era started in 2012, because even though Hu Jintao actually wanted this shift, which nobody actually said was anti-Dong, even though they say Xi Jinping is anti-Dong, actually it was 2012, because even though we had wanted to do it earlier, it was only Xi Jinping who was actually able to achieve it. So basically admitting this is like an inherently sort of political thing, right? So let me just, let me have that as a sort of sidebar too. Um, and also this issue of periodization isn't just like a China thing. So Simon Miles, a uh, good friend of mine at Duke University just wrote a book about Soviet foreign policy in the 1980s. And he shows that actually the idea that, you know, Gorbachev declared his predecessors to have been an era of stagnation doesn't do account for actually just how much people like Chernyenko and Andropov realized that things were not going well and were hoping for an opening to have a conversation with the United States, right? So it's not just a China thing, uh, basically. But what has Xi Jinping said about whether or not it's a new era? So obviously the history resolution, I think, is a good start. But what's really interesting is when you read this document closely, you're struck by how much it emphasizes continuity, not discontinuity, especially with regards to reform and opening. Why do I say that? Well, first, the resolution states explicitly that with regards to the two previous resolutions, their basic points and conclusions remain valid to this day. Second, the document praises the non-radical Mao while still condemning the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and the new document elides references to Mao's arbitrariness and personality cult, which is significant, right, for the new resolution not to explicitly say that. But the, revolution, the resolution still affirms that the Central Committee of the party failed to rectify Mao's mistakes in good time. So it's still giving a role to the Central Committee to, you know, to play a role if, if the leader gets out of control. Uh, the document praises the, the 1978 Third Plenum uh, in extremely positive and hagiographic terms. Uh, with regards to ideology, it emphasizes that Marxist theory is not a dogma, but a guide to action. And that, quote, uh, and condemns, quote, a mechanical application of the templates designed by authors of Marxist classics. The resolution also identifies the CCP objective as seeing that the market plays the decisive role in resource allocation. Uh, and it condemns leftist radicalism by noting achieving national rejuvenation will be no walk in the park and it will take more than drum beating and gong clanging to get there. China is still in the primary stage of socialism. Uh, I recently read a forthcoming article by a colleague of mine in Taiwan named Zhong Yanlin, who I think of his sort of mid-range generation is the best when it comes to elite politics in China, really keep an eye out for his work. He says when he read this resolution that it seemed to him that a key signal that it was trying to get across is we're not going back to the Mao era, right? Now, why do I think Xi Jinping is stressing continuity? Well, first of all, as you've heard me say in previous talks that if you want to talk about somebody who understands how sort of radical new interpretations of history can be destabilizing is Xi Jinping, right? Because his father's story for much of his career was exactly how dangerous it can be in destabilizing these different, you know, uh, radical turns in terms of interpretation of party history. I can say it again in the Q&A if somebody wants to hear it. Um, but I think that what he's trying to do is that he's at least trying to make the case uh, that he won't make either leftist or rightist mistakes. Uh, to make it seem like the party moves from one triumph to another, right? Like you can't say that the party was wrong in the past if the party is a historical force, the only historical force that can bring China to where it needs to be. You can't reject it from an opening if you have that kind of view. Uh, and I think he also needs to give a good, but at the same time, and this is where the, the tension is, that he needs to give a good story for why he has collected so much power in his hands. And the answer is that it's because previous problems everyone wanted to solve weren't solved because of a lack of party discipline which required a core, and he was the right person to be the core. Uh, the problems arose because, and this is a quote, the CC's Central Committee's major decisions and plans were not properly executed. In fact, the document explicitly states that discipline is necessary reform and opening, right? Saying that his policies aren't a rejection from an opening, but actually is to make reform and opening better. Um, and also, so Zhu Jiamu, in that same article that I just mentioned, said, uh, we should summarize the experiences of the two eras and develop the strengths of the two eras in order to bring reform and opening to a new level, right? So sort of a, a synthesis, um, best of both worlds type approach. Uh, so what is the policy relevance for this? 
Uh, the first is with regards to elite politics, which I started with, uh, don't hope for an elite revolt. Don't hope for a course correction from a coalition within the party that rallies because of a sense that Xi Jinping is incompetent or his policies uh, are not um, popular enough. Like I said, it's possible, um, but very, very, very unlikely given the picture of a leader-friendly system that I've described to you tonight. Uh, and as for ideology, I'm not coming up here to say Xi Jinping isn't as bad as everybody thought. I don't want people to think that I, this is like a pro sort of Xi Jinping talk. I think that the fact that the Xi Jinping that I've described to you, if you see China as a country that you want to compete with, this isn't necessarily good news because it shows that he's a more cagey individual, one that you know still has some capacity for not you know um, doubling down on policies um, that aren't working, which I think makes him still quite different um, from Mao uh, and Deng. Uh, and also this idea that you can't just read Mao and predict exactly what Xi Jinping is going to do. This is someone who is, you know, has agency and is creative and is a, has a sort of entrepreneurial spirit when he comes when it comes to what he wants to pick and choose um, from these ideological views um, uh, uh, with regards to the past. Uh, will this um, persist? Maybe, um, but two things could change. The first is, I, as I said, there were multiple Maos, um, but there might also be multiple Xi Jinpings, right? So after the 20th Party Congress, he's going to go from very secure to, you know, who knows how secure unless we're all sort of wrong. And if you're that powerful for that long, it's possible that the sort of uh, hubris that we saw increasingly um, come to Mao Zedong might be something we see in China uh, again. And also we've seen Xi Jinping talking about the relationship with the United States in a way that uses very sort of Stalinist language by which I mean, he talks about how the United States, because of ideological differences, sees in China a threat that will only become greater as China grows more strongly, and therefore American attempts to prevent China's growth uh, will be even more brazen, right? This idea that as you become more powerful, the enemy counterintuitively becomes an even greater threat. So the extent to which um, there is a sort of um, regime security psychosis within the regime, especially with regards to relations with the United States, we might see things that are traditionally seen as more so-called leftist policy. So uh, I've gone, I guess, uh, as long as I've promised, and uh, I'll stop. And um, uh, that's some food for thought. And uh, if I'm wrong, you can holler at me. And um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them.